Is anyone else exhausted, drained, stressed out of their minds? Maybe for us here in Australia, it's the constant task of drinking Red Bulls and coffee in order to stay up as late as 4am and the praying that Kevin Peterson isn't on commentary that is causing us to stay on the edge of our seat. Stokes here. That could definitely be the case, but from what I've read on social media over the last few days, maybe it's just the nature of this Ashes series. So far this series, we've been treated to not only three exhilarating and close test matches, but also session after session of higher level and even test cricket between two teams so desperate to win every single battle. It has truly exhausted me. Pat Cummins post-match said that he wouldn't mind a test where a team wins comfortably. Me too, Pat. Me too. But Cummins also made this comment in the media, which has caught my eye. As the series heads to Manchester, do you fear maybe momentum has shifted in England's favour here? Uh, not really, no. Why not? 2-1. Uh, <laughs> Cummins can try and comfort himself with the fact that Australia still leads the series. But the Basball wheels are now starting the roll after they won the third test. And that was all thanks to one man. Woohoo! It is very rare to see Aussie cricketers truly fearful of a fast bowler. On the faster wickets of Australia, we often see quicker bowlers thrive, and as a result, Aussie batters become used to facing aggressive, high-octane bowling early in their career as a means of progressing through the ranks. We saw that over the Australian summer as South Africa brought over express quicks like Kagiso Rabada and Anrik Norkia, who are very good international bowlers. Despite this, they both struggled to have a great impact on the series with their pace dipping at times, meaning both were well managed by the Australian batters. Realistically, it could be argued that the last time Australia was faced with the prospect of a bowler bowling upwards of 150 was the last Ashes in England when Jofra Archer got his pace up. And during those test matches, the Aussies never really found a method to kick me down for the whole series. That's why I was so disappointed when Mark Wood wasn't selected for the first two tests, as I believed him to be one bowler that could truly strike true fear into the Australian top order, like Archer did some years ago. I don't mean fear in the sense of being outclassed and made to look foolish like Stuart Broad. I mean fear that upsets your willingness to stay in the fight, keep your feet moving, and attack the short ball. With a player like Broad, there is fear, but there is also a sense of problem solving that comes with him, meaning that if you can figure out a method, you can prevent him from getting you out. But when a bowler is bowling 150k bounces at your head, all your plans can be thrown up in the air. However, traditionally there are weaknesses to bowlers who bowl at this pace. Often, they will bowl a magical ball to get a wicket, but they aren't precise and will often leak runs, meaning that you'll have to utilise them sparingly, or you risk batters capitalising on some loose balls. No. Woohoo! Well, someone forgot to tell that to Mark Wood, because he went for just two runs in his opening four overs of the series. There were no bad balls, just fast, well-directed bowling, with Marnus Labuschagne defending valiantly, but scoring no runs. I mean, look at this ball. One bounce, over the rope, and breaks the advertising board. And that was in the third over of the spell. Wood was consistently over the 150 mark, and with there being no bad balls bowled, all Marnus and Kawaja could do was attempt to wait it out. And speaking of Kawaja, the way Wood set him up was so clever and proved it wasn't all brute pace. Reflect on Kawaja's dismissals in this series before the Heavenly Test. Uzi has looked pretty rock solid, leading the run scoring and only really getting out due to his own lack of concentration. He played this shot against Robinson that was never on, got lazy against Stokes, left one that he shouldn't have against Tong, and fell to a stupid hook off broad with the whole field set back. Each wicket could have probably been avoided, and given that each one was against a different bowler, it suggests that no one in the England team had a proven method to get him out. So, Mark Wood goes to work in his first over against him. He bangs one in outside off. Second ball, same length but a bit straighter. Next up, fast bouncer, which Kawaja ducks well. Fourth ball, left, outside off, back of a length again. The next one is too wide and outside off, but the plan is still set and the final delivery is the money ball. Kawaja is not a big mover of his feet. Players like Root and Labuschagne, for example, pride themselves on their foot placement and getting down the wicket towards the ball, whereas Kawaja likes to trust his eyes and wait on pull and cut shots. During this over, you can see that Kawaja was really sitting back and waiting on that ball that he could pull through mid-wicket. And after 3.5 overs, where no balls were really hitting the stumps, a fast in-swinger aimed for middle stump was the last thing Kawaja was expecting. If he was facing Robinson or Broad, Kawaja would just block this, 
but due to the extreme pace, he reverts to his natural instincts, doesn't move his feet at all, and trusts his bat swing to connect with the ball, which fails massively, uprooting his leg stump. That was some classy and intelligent bowling from a man who isn't given enough credit for his cricketing brain. Wood finished on 5 for 34 after cleaning up the tail later in the innings. In the second innings, Wood played a different but just as important role. If you woke up in the morning and saw only the dismissals of Smith and Labuschagne off Moeen, you probably thought something along the lines of what the hell were they thinking? And you'd be right, but these lapses in concentration weren't by coincidence. It was again due to Mark Wood. With Wood in the middle of a rapid spell at one end, the white ball off spinner brought in on a week's notice to play in the test series appears the most appealing option to score runs. So, Labuschagne plays a slog sweep straight to the man on the boundary, while Smith played an uncharacteristically uppish glance into the leg side. Markwood doesn't necessarily make the plays around him physically better, but they do get taken for granted, making them more threatening. All of that value is without even mentioning his contributions with the bat in the match. Wood scored 40 runs of 16 balls in the game, which in the grand scheme of things proved pivotal. After the fall of Chris Wokes, Wood charged out to the crease to link up with the cricketing force that is Ben Stokes. The team trailed by 120 run runs and was looking at a large first innings deficit. When Wokes got out, my view was that Australia would be batting within 20 minutes. Yes, Stokes is a freak of nature, but he didn't really have the support cast necessary to get parity from such a long way back. So you'd think Mark Wood would just come out and look to play defensive and just hang in there. <laughs> Side, I reckon that's six more, it is. Those 24 runs brought Australia's lead to double digits and Stokes didn't even have to contribute. Australia were once again on the back foot and after Stokes crashed his way to 80, Australia only had a slight lead and with England's record of chasing down scores, it was always going to be their game to lose from there. It was fitting that Mark Wood was out there with Chris Wokes when he hit the winning runs after they had both come into the team and each done a fantastic job in order to keep the Ashes alive. I really do think that England are very much in the series now. In my opinion, Australia doesn't have two chances to win this series, because I'm telling you now, if England wins at Old Trafford, I give Australia next to no chance of winning the fifth test at the Oval. This coming game is the grand final for Australia. They simply have to win it if they want to win the Ashes. That's why Australia has a bit to ponder heading into the next match. I'm going to put out a video in a few days discussing the makeup of the Australian team, as I feel as though there are a lot of questions they need to answer. As for now, let's all enjoy this week off before it really, really starts to get crazy. Woohoo!